So my name is Vicky. I'm a technology manager for a company called Oshore based in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, I have been using Salesforce for about nine years. Um, my role there is technology manager and I also do run the Brisbane user group co-leader and do the um, Brisbane Trailhead Tuesday with Beck, who's also on the line as well. Okay, so um, hi everyone. I don't know what time it is everywhere, so I'm not going to embarrass myself. Uh, my name is Adrian Cutcliffe. I am a Salesforce consultant for a company called Salesfix. Uh, it does have a big F. My boss would get angry at that. Um, my I, fault. <laughs> I co-lead the Brisbane Australia Women in Tech group. Um, I am a Salesforce MVP and a Salesforce Lightning Champion as well. So we're going to move on to, uh, I guess, what we're doing today. So first, um, welcome to everyone. Next, we're going to, I guess, give you a little bit of an introduction into who we are, followed by our certification champions for the months of April and May. Then we're going to kick into our master data management topic and finish up with any questions that you may have. So the Ladies Be Architects team, uh, so it was founded by uh, Gemma Blizzard, which is, she's on the call, uh, and she has her two co-leaders, Charlie Prinsloo and Susanna St. Germain. So these are, I guess, Title three friends with a shared vision who've come together to help empower women and allies alike to become Salesforce CTAs and share their journey. Absolutely. Next. Sorry. Nothing, don't worry, carry on. <laughs> uh, next, we've got our three ambassadors in Australia. So Emily McCowan, Vicky Jeffrey, and myself. Um, so we're all, I guess, getting started on our Salesforce architecture journey. Emily has just finished two of her architecture certs. Vicky and I are on our way to our application architects. So we are right along this journey with you in the thick of it. So hopefully we can shed a little bit of light on that. Okay, so we're going to go through our champions for April and May. Are these wonderful ladies who have all passed certifications, either um, the application or systems architects, um, domain architect certs, or on their way to them. The first one is community cloud consultant, and that's I'm going to really try and get these names right, but Doria Hamelrick. So congrats, Doria. Woo, well done. So next, um, again, I'm trying my best with all of these names. So we've got Radhika Banzel, who uh, has completed the de de development white cycle and deployment designer. It's early for me. Well done, Radhika. Next one is integration architecture designer. This is one that I am not looking forward to, but Priscilla Ringwick. Congrats, Priscilla. This month we had two platform app builder certifications. So Libby Zamelis and Amanda Beard Nelson. UK represent. Jim is the, Jim is the square. The, Jim is the chair squad. <laughs> All right, so platform developer one. We've got five this time: Kerry Townsend, Louise Lockie, Alikia Mandadi, Anna Lotnin, and Sarah Sarah Herrera. Woo! Congrats, everyone. That was a tough one as well. So well done, everybody. <laughs> Next up, congratulations to everyone who's got sharing and visibility designer. We've got Shakira Walker, Virginia Leandro, Natalia Tatarova, and myself. Data architecture and management designer, Virginia Leandro, Adrian, and myself. Uh, and then next up, we have our lovely people who have, as a result of any of those certifications over the last two months, also achieved application architect. So congratulations to Louise Lockie, Anna Lachlan, and Virginia Leandro again. Alrighty, so if you want swag and you've passed a certification, mention at ArtLadies on Twitter and send us your address at the uh, URL there. 
we've actually started sending out vouchers for these now as well um so if you what we, do, we actually have a, a red bubble store which um has all of our ladies the architects swag on it um and we we found that to make this work at scale it was easier to give everybody a voucher so we're going to be doing a voucher run in the next week or so so please make sure that if you do want to receive a voucher um, that you let us let us know. Um, we do keep your name and email address in our Salesforce org for the purpose of tracking um, certifications, so that we can send you these things. So if you don't want us to do that, please let us know, and we'll ha we'll um, happily exercise your right to be removed. Um, but look out for um, if you get in touch with us, we'll be able to send those vouchers to you. And if anyone on the call has completed a certification and does want that, I've also copied and pasted that Bitly link into the chat on here. So you can click on it and just send us your address that way. Okay, so as we said, today is uh, Master Data Management from the Data Architecture and Management Designer Cert. This is, it sits on the Application Architect side of the Arctic Pyramid. So just a little bit about master data management from the exam guide. So master data management only makes up 5% of the data architecture and management designer. However, we really wanted to get into it because it is important for, I guess, a lot of what you do in day-to-day -day Salesforce. It's also going to come in really handy when you're considering what data models you want, when you're working on your integration um, in a lot of different places. So. Master data management includes a number of different topics. So comparing and contrasting various techniques and approaches and considerations. So we're talking things like implementation styles, harmonizing and consolidating your data, establishing survivorship rules, thresholds and weights, leveraging external data, canonical data models and hierarchy management. So we're also going to go through in this session how you go about establishing a golden record system of truth um, I think we called it something else as well, so we'll go to that. Uh, we're also going to go through approaches and techniques for consolidating data from multiple data sources and how data, sh data survivorship works there. Uh, and going through the appropriate approaches and techniques to capture and maintain this data and pre preserve traceability. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Vicky to kick off the details. Okay, so uh, first off, we need to understand what is master data management. And to understand that, we should understand master data. So a master data includes um, data like product, customer supply, location, or asset information. So it's your key or critical data in your system. It's not transactional data. It's often referred to as a golden record of information once you get that record correct. And as I said, it is the core or crit critical data of your organization. Master data management itself is the method used to define and manage that critical core data. Uh, and it manages data sharing. So you have a system that manages data sharing between your different business systems and platforms. So now that we've covered what master data management is, we want to talk a little bit more about why it's important. So data, master data management helps to provide a trusted CRM it consolidates and provides you the best available information that's reliable for that single source of truth or that golden record. So that means that regardless of your systems, it can help you see your customer data all in one point. Uh, it also improves the overall data quality of the CRM by eliminating duplicates and ensuring that relevant information is always avail available. So you might have correct addresses in one place, correct billing addresses in another place, if you're integrating, master data management can help you have all of the correct data. Uh, and it also uses that correct data then for reporting and analytics without needing to access those individual systems, do those tireless V lookups, uh, or just running individual reports and seeing if you can map them up yourself. So why do we need master data management? So when we look at things like data quality and data governance, um, we've got to understand what the challenges that we're facing are. So for data quality, you might have multiple versions of truth or multiple systems and sources of data. You might have duplicate data either in one system or across systems. 
you might have no standardization across the systems and maybe no standard hierarchies. And with data governance, this melds in a little bit with data quality, but you might have no rules for determining those data sources, uh, or no rules for identifying that, that correct data, uh, no rules for matching or merging, and you might have no standardization rules across systems. And your hierarchies might not be defined. So if we're looking at uh, CRM challenges, again, this is very similar to the data quality and data governance, or it is that. Um, you, you might have multiple CRMs due to mergers or acquisitions that you're struggling with, or multiple entries for a single customer in one CRM. And you might have no integration or syncing across systems. Uh, you might have no standardization for data or process flows, and we're gonna go through that in the next slide. There might be incomplete or missing data, and you might have no standardized hierarchies to understand reporting and what data that you're needing to display and reporting. So some examples of data quality issues. For no standardization, you might have three different CRMs or data sources that are trying to show um, the, uh, the uh, hierarchy of client where you might have gold, silver, bronze in one. You might have level one, two or three in another and maybe platinum, gold, silver in a third. They all mean the same thing, but they certainly aren't the same thing. So you need to be able to standardize that data across your systems. The middle one, so you might have multiple versions of the truth, no matching rules, your hierarchies might not be defined, and you might have multiple entries for a single customer one CRM. So this example shows a company called Perfecto, but we've got them in there about six or seven times where they're either Perfecto Proprietary Limited, or maybe just Perfecto Limited, or we've got a, a sub-branch in South Australia that we've got in as, as an account. Might be a global branch, might be just Australia. So you need to understand what the hierarchies are with these and which ones should actually be merged or are the same. And the third one is multiple versions of, of truth. So um, with this one, you've got two different CRMs, but you've got the same name. In this particular example, there's one digit difference on the phone number, so how do we know which one is correct? So we need to understand with our data quality how we find that out. So MDM implementation styles. So there are four. The first two I'm going to look at are registry and solidation. So registry, this, this is where the, the must data is created without changing any data in the source systems. It uses data cleansing and matching tools in the source systems themselves. It does not utilize a central hub. And the data in the source systems is not modified based on your um, data matching. Uh, and mainly, it's mainly used for analytical purposes. So it's about gathering data and putting it into a spot that you can then manipulate to use for things like analytics but you're not then putting, taking it back into those source systems. Consolidation, so this is where data is gathered from various source systems and consolidated in a central hub, but the source systems continue to use their own master data, so we're not changing those source, source systems again. Data is cleaned and matched and integrated in the central hub, but those source systems are not modified, so you are getting clean match data, but they're not, the data is not going back to the source system. This provides a trusted source of data for reporting and analytics. Now, this might be look like a bit of a strange one to do, but if you're not wanting to change data in your source systems, but still gather and report on data, consolidation is where you're wanting to be. The next two are coexistence and transaction centralized. So coexistence is where you create a consolidated set of master data in the central hub. It is updated in the source system and then synced with the hub. This offers a balance between system level management and centralized. So this is where you are doing some um, data um, matching, et cetera, in both the, the, the source system and the central hub. So transaction centralized, so this is management and updating is all done in the central hub. The central hub is a single provider for all of the master data across your systems. Enhanced data is then published back to those source systems using a primary key. So this is full centralization. You're not doing it in, in source and hub. 
So an example for a centralized um, um, MDM solution. So we have the data sources on the left, a couple of CRMs. There's an HR system in there and an ERP. In the middle, we've got the master data management hub where our data review happens. We'll be going through matching data governance, hierarchy management and survivorship in later slides. Um, but these are uh, ETL or extract transform load tools that we can use to clean and standardize this data. Uh, and for a centralized style, we'll, we're gonna need that primary key that is the same across all systems for matching and updating. On the right, we have some integrated systems that we could also use for uh, uh, the, the cleanse data for, um, being reporting and analytics or BI tools, business intelligent tools, and possibly a data warehouse for a central storage repository, if that's what you're wanting to do. And then you can see on the left where we've got the arrows pointing in both directions between the hub and the, the sources. So that's where we're going to update all of those data sources with um, the correct data that's been identified in the master data management hub. So next we're going to talk about those system of record, those single source of truth and those golden records. So a system of record uh, is an object of truth that in the system, a specific piece of data, whether a field or an object is correct. That system of record then could contain different information or data in a field. Uh, to obtain your single the system of record or that single source of truth, you want to review all of your data processes and flows with your business user. Um, these records could then be updated in the single source of truth so you can have multiple places coming in that are all updating this record. It could be either a data warehouse repository, it could be an application like your CRM or Salesforce. So when you're creating this system of record or this single source of truth, you need to define a data strategy that would be set by stakeholders to define that system. So where everything is gonna go into and what those records are going to look like as well, matching on a primary key, which we'll touch on a little bit more. So important then when you're migrating into your system is your data consolidation. So data consolidation is collating master data from multiple sources of truth and integrating it into that central hub that Vicky mentioned from the previous slides. So this data can be consolidated in the central hub and then pushed out to any one of your locations. It uses matching rules defined by either your primary key or your foreign keys. It also comes into play with data survivorship and master data rules. Uh, and it can then be updated from the source systems retained in the central hub or pushed out to other systems depending on your master data management requirements. So once data is matched for consolidation and duplicate rules have been defined to determine that data, we then have data survivorship that comes into play that Vicky will be talking about a little bit later as well. So moving on, we have canonical modeling techniques. Now, um, I personally hadn't heard of this a great deal before, um, and I did have to Google canonical just to remind myself what it was. So if you do Google it, don't be scared of all the others. We're really using the mathematical um, definition of it, which is creating a general rule or a standard formula for all of our data. So canonical data model is a form of enterprise application architecture that aims to prevent entities, sorry, I don't know why I put prevent. Um, <laughs> it helps you define entities and relationships in their simplest forms. It creates a common definition of your data to contain and translate types of data. Uh, and modeling techniques that you can use, you can really bring them into any system, such as an enterprise service bus, business or performance process systems, and service oriented architecture models. So canonical modeling techniques create a need to create a data model, basically, which supersedes all others, which includes a translator module or layout and it replaces standard point-to-point -point modeling systems. So if we move on to the next slide, we're gonna show you what a canonical data model does look like. So for standard point-to-point -point mappings, you can have multiple systems that shove into multiple systems. So you've got multiple systems on top of multiple systems syncing back and forth. With your canonical data model, it's essentially 
um, the same type of model that we talked about, we talked about centralized, just in a different format. So we've got system one, two, and three. They're then pushed into our canonical data center, which then converts them. It translates that data ready to be pushed out into your other systems. Okay, so, so before we go through data matching, I think at the beginning we didn't say, if you've got any questions, please throw them in the uh, chat window and we'll uh, keep an eye on those and answer them for you. Okay, so with data matching, um, there are two data matching types. These are deterministic and pro probabilistic. probabilistic. Uh, so deterministic, so this is going to look for an exact match between your records or pieces of data. And it's good when data has been cleansed and standardised prior to matching, but is this realistic in our environments? So probabilistic is more the one that people use. This uses a statistical, statistical approach to determine if two records represent the same information. So that could be something like a like, uh, and we'll go through some of the other, other techniques in the next slide. Um, it assigns a percentage indicating the probability of that match and gives a, a threshold or a weight. Uh, it gives a wider set of data elements that can be used when you're trying to do your matching. Um, so those weights are used to calculate your matching scores and thresholds are then used to determine a match, a non-match or a possible match. It has a higher accuracy in matching records and we'll look at why in the next slide. So we go into data survivorship. So data survivorship is the process of identifying and resolving those duplicate customer records. So with a probabilistic approach, each field is validated and weighted or scored to decide on that survivorship. And if two fields have the same weight or score, precedence will determine which value should survive. And that could be something like most recent record. A data uh, service, remember there, a data survivorship strategy needs to be defined by reviewing with stakeholders and users to understand all of the data flows. So it's not a, a one-size-fits-all approach. You need to go through and decide how is our data um, gathered, what are we doing when, we, when we're gathering it, and, and go right through those data flows. And a master data management system will then take those rules that you've set and define which record or field is kept as that survivor and then where it's updated. So data survivorship strategy um, is it, as I said, it needs to be defined by reviewing with your stakeholders and users to understand those data flows. And it could include things like structure of the data, the source of the data, how is the data populated, who is it populated by, what's the nature of the data, and the nature of your business rules. But five of most common we look at are the most accurate. So this is using validation rules to check accuracy of a field. So that could be that an email is the correct format, that an address is the correct format. Most recent, so when a record or field is added, updated or modified, most recently. And then most frequent, so if you've got multiple uh, records for one client, then um, which is the most frequent field in there? Uh, most complete, so more field views are populated in a record, so we look at that as the most complete record. And then we can also leverage against reference data. So that's looking at external data sources like data.com or some third party uh, options to see if your data is the same as what is in those um, source systems. So a master data uh, management system will take all those rules and define which data is kept as a survivor and where it's updated. So we look at some examples. The first one, uh, we're looking at the address field. So and we're looking at most frequent. So the second two have both got one, two, three, four, five Market Street. Those two are the most frequent. The top one, one, two, three, four, five Powell Street, is out on its own. So we would, the system would then look at uh, merging the two, those, the number two and number three, the second and third record in those lists. Most accurate. Again, we're looking at the address fields, but this time we've got two records. While they're the most frequent, they're one, two, three, four, five Street. That's not uh, a valid street address, while the first one, one, two, three, four, five Market Street, this one, so this is the most accurate. So this, the system will, as part of your matching, would look at um, that first record 
And then how do we deal with the second two because they've also got valid information in them. The most recent, specifically based on date updated, so this could be where your president comes in. If you've got multiple um, records that have the, are the same or are similar. So the most recent being the one that's entered in October 2019, being number three on the list. And then most complete, most accurate. So if we're looking at our number three in this example, um, that's the most complete. So that's got the phone number filled out, the email filled out, the address filled out, everything's filled out. Number two doesn't have the email filled out, but it does have a valid phone number. So with this one, we'd be looking at putting together numbers two and three or, or matching numbers two and three and duplicating and um, merging them. And while number one has the same information as the other two, but does not have phone and email. So now we're going to talk about leveraging external reference data. So a lot of the things that we've talked about here and that Vicky's just gone through with data survivorship, you don't need to do yourself. So you can use external data services to help you consolidate, deduplicate and manipulate your data. Um, so you could use these such as data.com or third party applications from the App Exchange. You can also use external data sources to provide additional information about your clients. So things like Dun and Bradstreet, maybe you've got a LinkedIn connection, things like that. Uh, and you've got some other external data sources that can provide additional functionality and process management. So think about other systems that you can integrate. Maybe your accounting software has your most up-to-date billing information or your human resources system has the most up-to-date information about your staff. Think about leveraging those in your other environments. So we're then going to move on to hierarchy management. So first we wanted to touch on the benefits of hierarchy management and why it's important in a master data model. So the benefits of hierarchy management include clearer visibility and more structure to your data, providing that fuller picture, which at the end gives you better reporting of your data and allows you to see all of those connections so that all areas of your business can benefit from it. And effective assignments and territory management is also important. So you're not only moving records into your system or assigning them, but you're also giving access to them to the correct people. So hierarchy management in master data management. So a master data management hierarchy, just trying to make sure the slides changed, yep, um, <laughs> just shows relationships between records in your master data management hub. So entities within this hierarchy can either be the same or different base objects if we're transferring them across. Relationships need to be taken into account in the hierarchy before the hierarchy is established. So you need to work out what's going to be related to what before you can start establishing that hierarchy. Now you can use foreign keys or primary keys to help match up this data just so everything's going into the right place. But most importantly as well, hierarchy management does help you prevent duplicates when you're syncing through from master data. So we can see on the right hand side, we've got a diagram of hierarchy management. So we can see here, we have multiple different site systems. So we've got two Salesforce orgs and one Dun and Bradstreet org that we're both syncing into one place. So all of those there, two, three McDonald's would sync through to our hierarchy. So global HQ, we then have a domestic HQ in both in, in the USA, some of those are in two places with sites beneath them. So establishing this model is incredibly important if you wanted to create that master data model and manage it. Okay, so the last part of the master, master data management section of the study guide covers capturing and maintaining metadata. Um, so we'll go through the ways in which we can do this. The first being event monitoring. So this will give you information based on whether you have the standard functionality or have paid for the additional functionality. So the standard functionality gives you login, logout, and insecure external assets. Now insecure external assets are things like images or videos that are accessed over an HTTP connection. Uh, these will have a one day retention in the standard functionality. For an additional cost, um, you'll get login, logout, insecure external assets, as well as URI, so that's where Plitz and Salesforce Classic, 
lightning. For that, you're going to get web clips, web, web clicks performance and errors, including the mobile app. So it will show you the for the mobile app. You'll get Visual Force page loads, API calls, Apex executions, and report exports. Now on that, you'll get a 30-day retention on everything, including the login, logout, and in secure external assets. Now in developer edition, you'll get free access to all these log types with a one-day retention. Now these are all, all this metadata can be downloaded after 24 hours. And it's downloaded as a, as a CSV, or you could use a C, CURL or Python. Uh, and you can access and query it via the API or Workbench. So it can be viewed in ISON Analytics with the Event Monitoring Analytics app. It's a standard app on the App Exchange, or by using third-party apps. And these are things like Splunk add-on for Salesforce, Fair Warning, or CloudLock. So it's not data that you can um, really look at properly inside the Salesforce UI, but you can access and look at it from other systems. The second one in capturing and maintaining our metadata is the setup audit trail. So this is tracking admin modifications, deletions of fields, password changes, flow changes, permission changes, all those things that, that are done um, by admins and by the system on, on a daily basis. These will show the last 20 changes shown on the screen. Uh, and your full history can be downloaded for the previous 180 days. So for the example there, you can see that there's a number of different um, admin changes or password changes or automated processes or salesforce.com changes where the system has actually done some, up, up, some um, updates itself. The third one is uh, custom metadata types and custom settings. Now, I'm not going to go over the specifics of what custom metadata types and custom set settings are for this study session, but it's important to understand the key differences uh, and between the two. Um, with the main difference when it comes to considering master data management, which I've highlighted in green. So in custom metadata types, these support pick list fields, long text areas, page layouts and validation rules. They support relationship fields and they can be referenced in a formula field and you can map with them. So you can map different configurations uh, inside your custom metadata type. With custom settings, it, it's, they do not support the extensive list of uh, fields that metadata types do. Uh, and they do not support relationship fields, but they can still be referenced in a formula field. They provide a list and hierarchy only, while custom metadata types is like an object. So for the purpose of master data, um, custom metadata types can be created as master data and then deployed in packages, while um, custom settings, you can deploy the, the metadata, but you can't deploy the master data. So the key thing there is that Custom metadata types can be deployed in packages, while custom setting data, master data cannot. And the next one is field audit trail, the next and last one. So field audit trail um, is an additional functionality that Salesforce provides compared to field history tracking. So if we compare the standard and, and additional functionality, the field history tracking we can track and display up to 20 fields on each supported object 18 months. Now, this was much longer until um, last year. I can't remember that the uh, release that it changed in, where Salesforce announced that they were going to be enforcing this. So some of your orgs will st may still have data in them that's older than 18 months. And if your org was created prior to June the 1st, 2011, it will retain all data. That's only for orgs that were created after June the 1st, 2011. And ours was created on June the 15th, 2011. So we did not scrape in. Uh, so the data is retained for 24 months and that uh, all of the data can be accessed via data loader. So you notice there's a difference between 18 and 24. So obviously you're not gonna be able to see the data in your UI between 18 and 24 months. And then after 24 months, that data is deleted. Now with field audit trails, so this is an additional functionality. This allows tracking of up to 60 fields per supported object for up to 10 years. You need to create a data retention policy, policy that sets, that's set for each object and that specifies the number of months that the data is displayed in the system and stored in big objects. So that archiving, once you set that data retention policy is done into a big object. 
So supported objects for both of these are um, custom objects, counts, cases, contacts, leads, opportunities, articles, assets, campaigns, contracts, and all the other ones that I've listed there. So not every object, but a good majority of them. Okay, so that's our presentation, and we're going to welcome any questions you might have. Please feel free to unmute yourself or put your question in the chat window. And we did just want to touch on as well, um, so Rebecca did ask um, that all of these recordings, also all of these sessions are recorded and shared afterwards. So if you've seen some important information in here that maybe your company isn't doing or you would like them to start doing, feel free to take them this presentation or do a little bit of your own to convey to your companies why master data management is important. I had one actually. Um, in terms of use cases, you talked about using customer, custom metadata types for storing the data because it's portable. And I thought that that was great and a really interesting approach as well. Um, let's say that you had that as an option and uh, maybe Salesforce wasn't the master for product data, for example. Um, you know, how could you ensure that you keep the, if, let's say you were keeping, um, you were keeping that um, product data in a custom metadata type and then um, propagating it across um, for different solutions and, and so on. Um, what would be, let me just think about the question. What, what it sounds like a hard one. Yeah, I, my brain's. <laughs> and as I started talking, my, 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 my brain was five steps ahead of my mouth, so apologies. I get that a lot. Um, can you think of any... Let me rephrase that question, because I think that that's a really interesting point, having that in custom metadata types. Can you think of any other situations where that would be useful? Other situations apart from sharing between Salesforce orgs? Yeah, because I. Well, or just a use case. Actually, sharing between Salesforce orgs is a good one. Um, but I was thinking about how would you keep, let's say you had um, as products as a um, as master data being held in a custom <laughs> metadata type, how would you keep that data synchronized with like opportunity? Uh, products like pri price book entries and uh, general product objects. Oh, right. And I apologise oh, for my okay, daughter. So She's just she just wants to entertain you all this evening. <laughs> She's fine. Okay, so this is completely theoretical because I haven't put custom metadata types into our system itself. Um, but you can map, so you can map between relationships and a custom metadata type. So I'm thinking that. You you could probably map, um, or create a relationship with opportunity in the custom metadata type, and then create a mapping within the custom metadata type. Is that what you're meaning? Yeah, and I'm thinking just brainstorming for a second. That would be great if Salesforce held the source of truth. What if you then needed to integrate? What if you needed um, SAP to know about what was in that metadata type? Then perhaps what would be your integration strategy for that? So I actually okay. have a Slack channel with this in. I have just realised partway through because we did this for a customer recently. Oh. Um, so we have used custom metadata to, and maybe it's in my email as well. Um, we've used custom metadata types just recently to map between a customer's source of truth, which is their SQL server, and in Salesforce. So all of their membership and management information is held in their SQL server. To work out where my email is gone. Holly, stop messing around. I'm going to close it down. Um, but we really just have custom metadata types in there that are defining the API name of the Salesforce field and the, I guess, keys within Salesforce as well as the primary key. Okay. To match all of those records for. So yeah. I'm really trying to find an example of that because we do have, apparently it's open somewhere. Is is the data flowing from the SQL Server into Salesforce, or have you got it? Have you got a bi-directional sync going on? It's flowing directly from the system into Salesforce. So we're only doing one initial push, and that's when a new contact is created. Once a new contact's created, uh, it's synced back up into their SQL Server, 
once that connection's maintained, it's purely coming from the SQL server back down. Right. Okay. So we did look at two ways of doing that as well. So what we had explored was the, I guess, the ability to post the development of the Salesforce to portal integration. So it's sort of coming back down. Um, so we did try, I guess, two different ways of adding the field into Salesforce, mapping it to the API so that we could determine the syncs um, of each way. Alternatively, we also looked at, I guess, um, get request records and then put records as well. We did opt to go for the um, custom metadata, just really if a new field was created, you could simply just go in, manage it, create that mapping and it would start pushing it back up or down. That's nice. That's a good example of how you can use it to support integrations. Hmm. Uh, Bibu's asked, you could have done with this with standard objects, right? What is the exact reason for custom metadata? I actually had this conversation with someone at a bank a couple of years ago when they were storing mm -hmm. some things. So they like, like as if it was a pick list, right? So, you know, back in the day, if you wanted to, um, let's say you had like a list of Let's say you had a chart of accounts and you had a custom object for general ledger accounts and they were always generally going to be the same. Um, that data was never really that portable. So people spawned up different solutions that would produce that data automatically before custom metadata types came along. And somebody said at, at this bank that, um, that when, they were, when we were going through the solution and they were explaining the data model, and that, uh, I said, how often does this list change? And they they basically built a custom custom object. I said, how often, how often does this list of options change? They said, oh, never. Okay, so uh, so what are the pro? What are the advantages and disadvantages of using a custom object versus custom metadata type? And um, this was basically me trying not to, you know, to to put him on the spot too much but he said well it's just data at the end of the day so it doesn't really matter where you store it and I'm just there going oh my god like, <laughs> kill me and then and then he said but it's actually best practice to put it in custom metadata type because you can move it between different sandboxes and I was just like so why haven't you done it <laughs> mm. so that's the key isn't it that you can move that that data yeah Sandboxes or in packages, yeah. I know there are a lot of uh, App Exchange products even as well that internally inside Salesforce do use custom metadata types. So we've done in the past, it's something called custom related lists where it allows you to have related lists for your objects that you can filter down on, on the record pages. And yeah. they use custom metadata types to, I guess, define each of the columns and what they're mapping to, what fields they're mapping to, because those don't change when you've got a related list quite often or you can go in and remap it. So yeah. that's still in that place purely for the purpose of there's no exact record inside Salesforce. The relationship is already there, say, between um, accounts and opportunities. You just want to display a separate related list of one opportunities. That's where custom metadata can also come into play in the benefit of, I guess, having data over the top of to link everything together. It's just a separate area that you can store it. Yeah. But it's like that portability makes all the difference, especially if you're working in an environment with yeah. lots of sandboxes and a full-on uh, DevOps process as well. Yeah. Sure. But also, it's just it actually it's, it's an extension as well because there's, cert there's certain custom settings you can use in formula fields um and being able to to make your formula fields more dynamic by using referencing in by referencing instead of hard coding it's actually quite a rewarding experience to build in that and to build with that um that relativity in mind mm. if you're a nerd like me <laughs> <laughs> all of us <laughs> all of us yeah <laughs> Okay, has anyone else got any other questions? I just had a thought. This is Alice Jones. So I see how we're talking about non-dynamic data, right? It's if you don't change. I was just trying to think in terms of, right, if some people have those index tables that they maintain, 
and in Salesforce, right, when you migrate to a new environment, you would have different IDs. So what you could potentially do, I'm just saying, I don't know if this is best practice, but in your custom metadata structure, you could actually have a field for each of your environments in addition to what the, you know, the external key is. And then you, you could do it that way, right? If you, were, if you wanted to have a custom metadata type that ported or was an index across all your environments, it was just a thought. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And when, uh, with reference to the IDs and so on as well, generally what I've found is that um, your sandbox of IDs will be different from production if you're pushing up to production for the first time. Once you've got that data in production and you refresh back down, your IDs should all be the same. Unless of course yeah. you refresh the first time. So it refreshes the, the IDs. Oh, so when you publish the data down to the lower environments, it updates the IDs as well? Yeah, depending on the type of sandbox you use. So if you've got a full copy sandbox, it, all of your data in that full copy sandbox will just have the same ID as it has in production. But bearing in mind, there will be new IDs. If you then add more data to the sandbox that isn't present in production, you will have different IDs. And you can get additional tools as well. Um, I did have a, I guess, a demonstration this week, which is the only reason that I know it. Um, but again, leveraging your third party data tools. So you've got um, products like Own Backup that will take a screenshot of your Salesforce. And they recently just started now allowing you to take that Salesforce data and port it across into sandbox organizations that aren't copies or full copies that is a direct copy of your production environment or whatever sandbox you wanted to copy it across from. So the other thing too that I just noticed, I think it's going back to the presentation, you were talking about the VLOOKUPs, right? Yeah. And I noticed too, when I was looking at the custom metadata, you can actually do SQL queries against them. Yes. You and can, so yeah. I'm wondering, say you're doing a lift and shift, right? Or you're doing some type of migration. I wonder if you could put those keys right into your custom metadata type table and then you could run SQL queries, right, to do any kind of like ETL type of stuff. Like, yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. I should have included that in the differences. Yes, you can um, do SQL queries on custom metadata types. So, yeah. so that might be one of the reasons like versus doing it in an Excel spreadsheet. That might be why you might want to put something in a custom metadata table is because you could basically run a SQL query against that custom metadata and against what you have currently have in your database, right? Or that you currently have in Salesforce. That's just another thought, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great, thanks. No, I'm geeking out, sorry. Don't ever apologize <laughs> for geeking out on a call full of geeks. As bad as <laughs> well, thank you for letting me do that. <laughs> My brain's just kind of. And I'll knock yourself out, love. You're good. <laughs> I guess, um, again, if you have any more questions, feel free to jump in. But before we did wrap up, we wanted to go through a couple of next steps that can help you on your journey to data architecture and management designer. So there is a trail mix specific to data architecture and management designer. Broken down in the bottom, you will find the master data management section because Trailhead and Trail Mixers are quite good at doing that. You can also check out the exam guide as well. So the first part that we went through was really just a snippet of that master data management section. So definitely get in and check out the full exam guide if you're wanting to take that certification. And we've included focus on force on there as well. So for those of you that have, and even for those of you that haven't used focus on force before, you can purchase study guides as well as practice exams from Focus on Force if you are trying to take any of those particular sections. And again, Focus on Force is really good at breaking it down into your different topics and segments of the exam. So you can study or complete um, mini exams based on master data management purely as well. So these are just a couple of places that you can check out if you wanted to continue on that journey or learn a little bit more. Okay, so that is us. Thank you very much for joining us and we hope that you enjoyed this and got something out of it.
Um, if you've got any other questions, please send them through to us. Uh, and we'll be putting this um, on the Lady of the Architects website as a recording soon. Thank you, Vicky and Adrian. Brilliant job. Thank you. Yay! Woo! Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining.